third speaker for the day is Shri Mohit Sir, Judicial Magistrate, First Class and Civil Judge, Junior Division. I request Ramya Chandrasekhar ma'am to kindly introduce the speaker to us. Thank you, Anaga. It is my privilege and honor to introduce Shri Mohit, Judicial Magistrate come Civil Judge, Junior Division at Hazaribagh, Jharkhand. So graduated in 2018 with a BA LLB degree from the KIIT University, Bhuvneshwar. Pursuant to this, sir cracked all the significant competitive entrance exam to secure admission to the LLM program. He completed his master's in law in the year 2019 from the faculty of law, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. As a law student, sir has been the recipient of several awards and accolades. Sir won the BCI moot and several other moot court competitions. Sir has also presented numerous papers in different competitions and conferences. Sir has also qualified the UGC net examination for teachers. In fact, at this point, I would like to add that I have had the great privilege of learning under Sir's guidance and mentorship and witnessing his unparalleled passion for law and learning a truly remarkable experience instrumental to my own decision to take up teaching. In the year 2020, Sir was selected and appointed to be a judicial magistrate come civil judge, junior division at Hazari Bhag, Jharkhand and is currently serving at this position. Thank you for agreeing to join us today for the session, Sir. On behalf of CMI University School of Legal Studies, I extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ramya. Uh, first of all, a very good morning to all the respected professors and my dear friends who have uh, joined me and who have given me this opportunity to share my experiences and journey with all of you. I'm extremely thankful to Ramya in person and all the uh, organizers, organizers uh, who have basically given me this opportunity to share whatever little knowledge, wisdom, or the information which I have acquired in my in my in my my short journey uh, so before i start what i have done is that i have made a very short ppt so that we don't deviate from the main course i have been given the topic of insights into judicial preparation so i would request ramya to share the pdf for once and then i would like to commence with the topic which has been assigned to me yes sir just a minute please uh, now I have been told. Uh, I have been told by Ramya that uh, the group of students who are basically attending this session they are a mixed bag. They are students from all the years, right? We have got students from all the years, first year, second year. We have got students from three year course, and we, are, we also have got students from LLM course. Uh, now I, I have already read the schedule, and I saw that two esteemed speakers have already shared their experiences. And they must have told you how, uh, what are the important things one has to keep in mind while one is preparing for a judicial services examination. What are the things which are, uh, which are expected from a judge? Uh, because uh, judicial system is unlike the other governmental system which is present uh, in, the, uh, in the setup. And how it is different from the other professions uh, which, uh, which, you, uh, 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 which, which are there. Uh, there. Now, uh, before uh, before uh, directly jumping into this topic that how one should prepare for a judicial services examination, there is this one very important thing that, uh, that, that, that all of us should ask ourselves. The question of why. Why do you want to take up judicial services? Now, generally in India, what happens is that uh, the examinations, the, the governmental examinations, they are given a very high pedestal that you qualify this governmental examination and you become a Sarkari Bab. And that is the ultimate aim of a family, of, a, of, of an aspiring judicial servant or a civil servant. And the buck stops there. So what is your aim in life? The aim of my life is to become a judicial servant or to become a judge. But what after that? Let's say there are 70 odd individuals who are attending this very course, and all of them are very, very dedicated and serious about this particular thing that they want to become a judge. They want to become a judge, and that's a very nice thing that you want to become a judge. What, what do you want to uh, do after becoming a judge? You want to live a normal life, or that was the only aim which you had in your life. Now, most of you will tell me that, sir, at this point of time, first of all, it's important for me to at least qualify the examination and then. 
I'll basically think what should I, what will I do after becoming a judge? But the answer of this question is very, very important. And let me tell you, whatever sort experiences I have had in the sort journey of mine, uh, the most important thing is the clarity. Why do you want to become a judge? You want to become a judge because it's a governmental job, because you tend to enjoy a lot of societal respect. Families recognize you, society recognize you, the, the society at large will recognize you. But let me tell you, all these things will not keep you up every single day. If your motivation is something which is not very intrinsic to render true justice, uh, that motivation will not survive. And after the point you have cracked the examination, that downward path will start. People don't tend to enjoy their job. As a result of which what happens, they don't work properly and efficiently. The number of cases increases. Now you must be hearing all across the country, the Honorable Chief Justice of India, various high courts, people saying that the number of cases are increasing, right? The number of cases are increasing in India. We have got one judge for 40,000 cases or 4 lakh cases or random data. But one very important thing which, which the system is not realizing is that what is happening here is that people are just qualifying the examination and after that they don't have any aim. They don't have that understanding that what to do, whether they actually want to render true justice or they are just here for the sake of salary, perks, or etc. Or the great societal respect which will come when you become a judicial magistrate. So that is why I'm saying that first, it's very important for you to ask these questions to you. Why do you want to become a judicial magistrate? Is it your personal mo motivation? Are you self preferent now, when you are in your law school, and that is why I keep asking and instructing students that please explore all the avenues which a law school offers. Go for an NGO internships, work with the downtrodden organizations, the organizations which are working for the development and upliftment of the downtrodden. If you have that sense of empathy and sympathy, if you want to work for the people, government, the governmental sector is there for you. And let me tell you uh, very clearly and categorically, this is not a merit-driven sector. For example, let's say you choose to become an advocate and you're working 12 hours a day, you're getting 15 briefs, 10 briefs per day, you will be paid accordingly and proportionately. The moment you join a government sector, this thing will not happen. Even if you dispose 150 cases in one particular month, promotion will not you will not be the first in the entire batch to be promoted. So there lies the concept of spiritual satisfaction, the concept that you are actually rendering justice to the poor. That should be your main point. If you are having that particular vision in your mind that you want to work for the masses and the downtrodden, definitely join the services. But if you are a, if you are a very, very aspirational student, who want to achieve the genet and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you should be anti-motivational or anti-aspirational, I'm not that. But this is how the system has been made up and it's very important for me to give you a correct picture because the moment you become a judicial magistrate civil judge at the age of 26, what next? Let me tell you what next for me. While I was in college, I was winning competitions. After that, I qualified LLM entrance examination. After that, I qualified the PhD examination and then I have become a judge. What next for me? So here it's very important for me to ask myself that what, what, what were the reasons because of which I chose to become a judge, right? Now, there are so many positives also. Now, what are the positives? The aspect of autonomy and independence in decision making. Now, that is a very crucial role and that is why I think uh, the profession of academics and the profession of judiciary is very different from the other profession. Uh, when you choose to join advocacy or you, when you choose to join a firm or a company, there, that principle of autonomy and independence will not be there. Now, I am a magistrate and tomorrow if a bail application comes to me, I decide that. Now, that decision of mine is absolutely mine. There is no external interference. So, while you are working, you get that feeling of autonomy. In, in, in jurisprudence, we study about Austin, right? So that feeling of autonomy, no external factor impacts my decision. If you like that feeling, this is the place for you. But again, I'm telling you, you have to do it for yourself, for your satisfaction, for the fact that you're rendering justice to the poor, not for the fact that you will be getting promotions and money and etc. So please have the answers of all these questions and then only jump into the preparation process.
generally what happens is that people jump into the preparation process they they qualify the examination also but then they start losing the motivation and this is something which has happened to a lot number of bright individuals who have qualified the examination after qualifying the examination they are posted to small districts in small districts you don't have robust infrastructure you come from big cities and all of a sudden you have been transferred to a remote district where the amenities are extremely scarce in so it's very important that first of all you should understand that this is how the lower judiciary works there is a difference between how the high court works or the supreme court works and how the lower judiciary works so to have a clear vision clear understanding what the lower judiciary is when you are extremely clear with that now the second question will be that how do i get a clear understanding go and intern in the lower courts the general trend is that we go and intern in high courts supreme courts but let me tell you the district courts are the first courts the first interaction between a litigant and the court system the judicial justice delivery system in, in this particular country takes place in the district courts so if you want to become a judicial officer i would request and implore all of you to go and do internships in the lower courts and to understand that how the system works so my first question was why one should go for judiciary once you are very clear with the answers of all these questions then only move to the next point ramya if you can just slide to the next now the second point is clarity in the thought process now generally what happens is that you are in your fourth year or fifth year and you are and and most of us are generally confused that what should we do uh should we take up a job in a company or should we go or practice uh, in the capital city of the state or should we go to delhi and start litigating there are so many things and i think clarity is something which is very important for any endeavor which you do in your life be it professional or personal similarly in terms of in terms of preparing for any examination and forget about judicial services examination in any examination it's very important that you need to have that clarity at times what people do that they are doing n number of things simultaneously and as a result of which they are not able to do any of those things successfully and the reason being is that lack of clarity if you have decided that you want to become a judicial magistrate or a judicial officer it's very very important that you should give yourself that amount of time in addition to this that should be your first and very important option if you want to become a judge let's say you guys are in your fourth year some of you might be in your fifth year now it's high time that you decide what do you want to become in your life you have already invested four to three years of your important life in understanding and learning law you have worked with different people you have interacted with great professors you have you you interact daily with your friends on legal topics and etc you are probably all of you are more than 20 at that point of time in terms of age so that is not after uh, after spending that amount of time in your law school it's very important for all of you to ask yourself this question that if i want to go for judicial services you need to have that clarity yes that clarity is very important and that clarity should keep in in the fifth year itself or early in the fourth year the earlier you have that clarity the less number of problems you are going to face in your preparation process coming to the next point it's very important to have a single aim again it's it's interrelated at times what students do is that they prepare for litig uh, they want to litigate also simultaneously that they, they join any coaching or judicial services they also want to appear in other examinations so instead of doing that i would rather recommend you to have one aim at one point of time and believe me believe you me you can give yourself those one year or 1.5 years and if you have been very uh, very diligent and honest about the preparations so let me tell you that whatever they ask in the examination it is nothing rocket science all the subjects have been taught to you during your graduation years so just the, the 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 second most important thing is to having an aim to become a judicial officer you should not be confused right and now coming to the preparation strategies part because i have already dealt with why why what are the why the, the, the answering the question why why do you want to become a judicial officer and having a single aim 
Now, uh, the topic which has been allotted to me is insights into the judicial preparation. So this is the main thing which today I had to speak about. Now, before jumping into this, it was important for me to tell you about the experiences, something which I've said. Now, coming to the preparation strategy. Now, all of you must know, and since all of you are judicial aspirant, and the fact that you guys are, are, are attending this particular course, I think you must have a brief idea about how the examination thing works in judiciary. It's a three-phase examination, prelims, mains, and the interview. Since uh, the university is situated in the state of Karnataka, and first of all, let me tell you, unlike the civil services, the state, the, jud uh, the judiciary is a state judicial services examination. We don't have a central examination per se for the entire country, right? And it's a class two job. It's not a class one job. And the state public service commissions in consultation with the high court or in some states, the high courts only organize the examination. Uh, now, coming to the preparation part. And, and let me tell you the preparation strategies which I'll discuss you, uh, which I'll discuss with all of you, uh, will be relevant for any state's judicial entrance examination, whether it's Karnataka, whether it's Kerala, down south, or up you come to Delhi, uh, UP, West Bengal, Jharkhand, etc. Uh, because the format of the examination is extremely similar. Apart from two or three different states where the questions are asked in a different manner. The questions which are asked in most of the states are, are in a similar tone and footing. So uh, yeah, the, the preparation strategy does not change much, right? But we have got different subjects being asked in different states. For example, Karnataka will have its own unique syllabus. West Bengal will have its own unique syllabus. So it's very important to be state-centric while you're preparing for judicial services exams. It's unlike the civil services where there is a one common pan-India exam, right? Now to start with, now before coming to the preparation part, and let me tell you, it's very important for us, for all of us to understand that the first exam is the prelims examination. Only when you qualify the prelims examination, you're eligible to appear in mains exam. Now, generally the questions are that how should we start, how should we prepare for the prelims examination? We have got so many books and resources. We have got so many different subjects. We tend, we tend to get confused because there are so many subjects and we are not able to manage the preparation. Now, the first thing is, and I'm telling you because I did not take any particular coaching to prepare for all these examinations. All these examinations, whether it's LLM, PhD, UC NET, or the Judicial Services Examination, I had prepared on my own. Now, when you are beginning your journey, the most important thing for you is to understand the question paper. Get all the question papers of that very examination, all the 10 year question paper or the 15 year question paper. For example, if you are interested in preparing for Karnataka UDC, get the past year question papers and you don't require the help or assistance from anyone. You can help yourself here only. Get those question papers and understand and dissect every single word from those question papers. And that is your syllabus and that is how they are going to ask you questions. And see, to be very honest, since you have invested five years of uh, five years in this process of studying law, you have that amount of maturity that if you honestly and diligently dissect and understand all the questions which have been asked in the prelims examination in the past 10 years, you will be in a position to say after that, that questions kaha se aata. So it's not a rocket science that you have to ask 10 different people that from where do I study? You just analyze the question. And let me tell you, uh, for example, there are other important and prestigious examinations like IIT, NIT, etc. And generally, uh, the team or the organization which is responsible for framing questions in these examinations, they have a think tank. So every year you have got new questions, brilliant questions. But unlike those examinations in judicial services or government services, there is this thing of, there is a thing called repetition. A lot of questions are repeated because they don't frame the questions. As any, they will sit down, they have a thing, they have a body specifically designated for that purpose and that purpose is to frame questions. No, they don't do that, right? On general basis, what they'll do is they pick up five important questions from CPC from this particular chapter. Okay, res judicata is important. Take one question from res judicata. So that is why when you're preparing for judicial services examination, the past year question paper becomes extremely important. 
If you have done the past year question papers, let me tell you, 50% of the job is done. That is it. Now, coming to the first point, one has to know what to read and what not to read. Now, while preparing for any examination, whether it's LLM or CLAT LLM examination or the LLM examination or civil services examination, the most important thing is that what not to read. While you are a student in your law school, you read papers, you research, you understand, you write so many things. That particular process has to completely change. Here, you don't have to know everything under the sun. For example, if you start studying res judicata in CPC or if you start studying the entire investigation process in CRPC in great amount of depth and precision, it will take a lot of time. So here you will have to understand the limitation of time and the fact that you have got limited energy also. You cannot study everything. You are, they are not asking you to become a giant in CRPC. They are expecting you to know the basic fundamentals of all the subjects which are there in the syllabus section. So that is why I keep uh, uh, requesting and telling students that you don't have to read everything. The way you used to study in your college years, you will have to change that particular approach. And you will have to study as per the requirements and demands of the examination person. So everything depends upon the examination. And this is where, again, the questions come into relevance. For example, if you appear in Delhi Judicial Services, the questions are case-based. So in Delhi, what they do is that they directly frame a question based on X case law. However, when you come to South, when you take about, when you take, when you take the example of Karnataka uh, or Tamil Nadu, they don't directly ask you case-based questions, right? So again, the process of preparation is going to be dependent upon the kind of questions which are coming in the state services. But even in that, you don't have to read everything. You will have to be smart in your approach, right? And this is the main reason because of which at times many brilliant students are not able to qualify the exam. It happens that you were the topper of your university, but you are not able to qualify the prelims exam. And people ask you that, why is it happening? It is happening because you're not understanding. In your, while you were in your university, you were preparing for one examination, one paper. And you had the liberty and luxury to, 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 to dive deep into it. Whereas when you are coming to judicial services, you have got 10 papers, we will ask you 100 questions and within a time span of 120 minutes, we will have to solve all those questions. So it's very important that your, that your preparation process is also suited to that. Second, bear centric approach. Now, this is very important. Again, while, you're in, while you are in your college, uh, let's say if I speak about evidentiary value of FIR, or I, I, I tell you about the concept of congregants, or let us say if I ask you about the concept of basic structure, if constitution is, is there. Now, uh, when you read basic structure in, uh, in your college or when you will read res judicata or res subjects, you will read the entire topics in depth. And I'm saying that you have to understand it in depth. But the most important thing is the words of the statute. And this is important for all the stages, let me tell you. In your college, I'll give you an example, in CRPC. Now, in CRPC, we have a total number, we have a total of 484 sections. Now, it is almost next to impossible that your college must be covering the entire CRPC. It is not possible. All the 484 sections are not taught in any college or university across this entire country. College will most probably teach you around 150 sections. But when you come down to the judicial services examination, they'll ask you at least 300 out of those 484 sections, 300 sections are very, very important. So it is not expected from you that you should memorize all the 484 sections, but at least 300 to 350 sections you should remember. Now, so you will have to read things which has not been taught to you in the graduation. It happens generally in exceptions. If they have taught you well, that's true. So it's very important that bare acts should become your friend. Let me tell you, even today, while we pass an order, so let's say our, uh, a bail application has been filed to us, we always keep the bear act with us. It is always with us because it is recommended to every single judge or an advocate or a law, or, or a, or a law student that in spite of the fact that you are extremely confident that 302 murder is an unbelievable offense and it's a compatible offense, you know that you, you don't have to give bail to it. But then also develop this habit 
of reading the bear acts again and again cases are important cases are also primary sources but the cases are nothing but interpretations of the provisions in the statute so it's very important to keep reading bear acts and the bear centric approach basically means in the prelims examination they directly ask you questions from the bear act so bear act should become your friend so you are waking up in the morning try reading 50 sections of crts and all these things will come into play in the latter part again in the mains examination or in the interview which i'll discuss now procedural laws i have mentioned here understanding thoroughly and 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 this is my uh, problem with the uh, indian legal education that generally in my opinion now since i have come to this particular side and i am understanding and seeing the seeing the law in operation in implementation now generally let me tell you uh, subjects like crpc and cpc can can never be understood properly if you are reading it from one proper book right there is a difference between indian constitution and the procedural laws you can be in your room you can take a book of vf sukla and mp jain and you can read the entire book and you can understand indian constitution but the same thing is not true for the procedural laws and this is something which all the students would understand and that, that is why i was requesting all of you that you go for internships in delhi high court supreme court but you don't go for internships in the lower court and internships in lower court is very very important because in order to understand crpc and cpc it's important that you have seen how the crpc and cpc works in reality in the courts so if you expect that you will get sn misra or pillai or any other book and if you start reading from the first page i am very very sorry you will not be able to have that understanding of students see it's like a story and you need to understand section 1 is not the first thing which happens when the law sets in motion so if i ask you a question that a cognizable offense has been committed has been committed let's say in delhi what is the first thing which will come into play so it will not be section 1 of crpc right it will not be section 2 of crpc it will be section 154 of crpc which is first in front fir even the word fir is not mentioned information in cognizable cases so generally when you start reading a book on crpc what happens is that because the book the books have been written as per chapters as per sections so a student is not able to understand the entire procedural laws very properly however if you have seen the operation of procedural laws in the court system let me tell you the entire exercise becomes a very very easy exercise and that is why most of the students say that we are having problems in understanding crpc or cpc or evidence because these are the laws which actually works in the ground at the ground it is unlike indian constitution where you can read 10 cases and you will develop a thorough understanding so i'll request all of you that if you get time please go and work in the lower courts only if you work in the lower courts you will be able to have that understanding of procedural law so while you have done your internship internships come back and then read till like then read as a mister you will have a very different understanding right the next thing is state centric up state centric approach now why i am focusing on state centric approach because i have already mentioned you that judiciary unlike the civil services is a state level examination we don't have a common pan india examination right uh, we are class 2 officers at the post of sdo or bdo then we we are given that post now every state has its own syllabus so let's say if you are uh, wanting to prepare for karnataka judiciary you should prepare as per the requirements and demands of karnataka judiciary for example in jharkhand they don't ask indian constitution up has a paper on indian constitution delhi does not have a paper on indian constitution so if you are preparing for delhi judiciary it's important for you to not to study indian constitution i did not study indian constitution for my preparation because jharkhand uh, in the syllabus of jharkhand there was no constitution at all so my humble request to all of you is that while you are in your fourth year and fifth year please select those one or two states if you want to prepare for karnataka judiciary study as per the requirements of that particular examination the subjects which has been covered in those examinations now one more thing which is very important 
generally what happens is during our five years we tend to uh, go for internships in high court and the supreme court now the constitutional language of the high courts and the supreme court in this country is english right so as a result of which all of you don't face, face problems in understanding the language in the trial court the language is the vernacular language of the state and this is something which you need to understand and a lot of us even let me tell you even me legal hindi is complicated similarly kannad legal kannad might be complicated similarly uh, legal bengali or bengali might be complicated for you because you have not worked uh, in bengali language so while you are appearing for this examination it's very important for all of you to make yourself conversant in the vernacular language start reading books start reading newspapers in local language so apart so apart from all the other things which you do having a very good understanding of the language is also very very important and why am i saying this so let's say that a graduate from your university that person becomes a judge in jharkhand judiciary right let's say he becomes a judge in jharkhand judiciary now he is someone who is brilliant in english he has got brilliant drafting skills brilliant writing skills but what will you do with a foreign language in a country which has got 100 100 types of languages in jharkhand people understand hindi mundari and etc so a common litigant who comes to your court what will you say will you tell him about keshavananda bharti will he understand or will you tell him about the recent bail judgment which has come from the annals of the supreme court no he'll understand only one thing so justice will have no meaning if you are not rendering justice in the language of the litigant and this is where the indian judicial system is faltering so if you are passionate about rendering justice at the very lower level of this country it's very important for you to equip yourself with all those skills which will come into play now i might be a great student i might be a great professor i might be a great debater but all your debating skills will not come into picture because the reason being is simple the litigant does not understand english he understands the vernacular language first your bail order is typed in english your judgment is typed in english all the works order seed and it's etc everything you are doing in a foreign language imagine him he is fighting for his rights and he doesn't even know what the damn system is telling him so i will request all of you if you have this deep sense of rendering true justice and that is where i say linguistic justice is very important the, the this aspect of language something which is largely ignored by our judicial system we tend to study everything in cases and we have not been indianized right so there i see that please have <clears throat> please have a thorough understanding of the local language while you are thinking of preparing for the examination and the last part now this is something which applies to all the examinations in this country one should not lose hope owing to consistent failures now i completed my graduation in the year 18 i had a plan the plan was i wanted to join academics i qualified all the elementary examination i did not take any coaching while i was there in bhu uh, varanasi i prepared for the judicial services examination and uh, coincidentally i was able to qualify the examination but unlike me a lot number of students are not able to qualify for the judicial services examination at that age you encounter multiple failures in your life and let me tell you failure is a privilege it's very important to fail if you don't fail you don't understand things from that particular perspective whatever i am saying all these things i have failed continuously i appeared in up judicial services interview exam i i appeared in the interview of up i appeared in the interview of mp and jharkhand was my third examination which i had qualified so i was able to qualify jharkhand judicial services examination only because of the fact that i i, I achieved a failure so i am intentionally using the word achieve failure is an achievement you fail when you are trying if you don't fail you never if you don't try you never fail so in in india in public examination the competition is extremely huge all of us know that take any examination and this holds true for all the examination whether it's llm ugc net it's very important to be patient and you need to have that that uh, that attitude of perseverance that this is my aim and regardless of anything in my life i am going to achieve this i i i will definitely confront 
failures at different stages of my preparation but that is not going to limit me this examination is not is not stronger than my determination to clear it so it's very important that you should be driven and motivated in this process and then take one exam take it as an examination see again i'm telling you and see this this becomes a very full circle india mein and i'm this i'm trying to make you i'll tell you this in hindi ki india mein hota kya hai ki and this is something which i have ex, experienced with my seniors with my batchmates ki unke liye sirf ek hi cheez important hai ki humko exam qualify karna hai and the moment you qualify the examination you don't have any other thing in your life ki humko bas ek hi cheez karna tha ki humko exam nikalna hai so while you are preparing for the examination you are extremely passionate you are extremely dedicated you are extremely hard working you work for 10 hours a day but the moment you become a bureaucrat the moment you become a judge you stop working right because for you and for your society life stops you have achieved your dream so that should sorry there was a there is an electricity cut off so that should not be the aim this is just a mere examination yes since we are human beings we we require decent standard of living and the fact that when you become a judicial officer you earn money you are having a, you can have a good life you can ha- give good life to your parents to your siblings to your family etc but at the same point of time you need to have a bigger aim in life the bigger aim in life should be to render justice to have that satisfaction to help the people when you have those particular things in your mind then only will you be able to to actually enjoy this process of justice and let me tell you and now i'm i'm coming to the to the harsh realities the infrastructure is extremely bad the the great public conception in india is that the moment you become a judicial officer you get two tunes you get bodyguards etc no absolutely not go to any particular state of this great country of india the infrastructure is languishing we don't have toilets in this judiciary at times we have to share our chambers with two or three different judicial offices this is the harsh reality so if you have this imagination that you are going to sit in a in a in a ac laden cubicle no it is not going to happen in india in lower judiciary that does not happen the government does not invest that amount of money in the infrastructure of course there are there are some states and i cannot because i have not been to all the states of this country all the judicial courts of this country so i cannot say but the situation is not that as it is generally projected the the infrastructure is not that very good very good you might be transferred to a remote location where there is electricity problem movement problem transportation problems you don't have people to hang out with and it's a reclusive life let me tell you it's a very Uh, one very important thing to understand is that in comparison to the other governmental job and the judicial job the life is stranded it's very very limited and the reason is very simple that you cannot interact with the public at large simple principle of natural justice because the same public is going to come to your courts as the things so that is why the judicial conduct is to keep yourself limited so while you are preparing for this examination you cannot expect that you can go party you can go and visit places a lot no that is not how a judicial a magistrate or a judge is supposed to live his life your life will become extremely limited you will be living in the judicial colony judicial quarter steadily we don't go extremely out and and there will be holidays no doubt there will be holidays you can have your life but it will be truncated and very very confined so and the last message of mine will be to never lose hope in this process whether you qualify this examination or not again i'm telling you examination is the most important is not the most important thing and every person in this planet is doing their own respective job i feel academics as a profession is very brilliant litigation is also very brilliant but it's the only thing is that you should actually know what do you want from your life the fact that judiciary offers you a good pay scale and a lot of societal position and respect should not be the main parameters for pushing you or encouraging you to become a judicial servant if you are actually interested in helping the poor join judicial services if you have that skill thank you and and i hope that you have got questions and i will be more than willing to answer all of your questions thank you so much sir
Now the floor is open for questions. All the students are requested to post your questions and doubts in the chat box and please do not unmute. I now invite Ramya Chandrasekhar ma'am to moderate the question answer session. Ramya, with your permission, can I just take one minute, please? Yes, ma'am, sure, please. Thank you, Mohit sir, for this wonderful session. Uh, I must say that the first slide, I think, brought smiles in all the women's faces because that was one thing that uh, we had in mind. And uh, the first slide has the picture of a lady judge. So, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for uh, helping us understand and our students understand that, uh, you know, women are very welcome because this is one thing that one of our uh, uh, students also had in mind. She had posted the question saying that, what about women in judiciary? So your first uh, PPT itself, the picture that uh, you have put itself is very reassuring. So thank you so much for that. And each PPT, I should say, is was was just just uh, you know on dot. So I, I just have to remember the picture. The second picture had uh, Arjuna pointing out at the uh, you know the bow. So you say be single focused. Then you put Doni's picture, which says that strategy is the best thing. And the last uh, slide was that don't give up hope. So I think in a nutshell, you put it beautifully. So now, yes, I uh, request uh, uh, Ramya to go ahead because uh, she has only good words for you, sir. From the time we, she suggested your name, she's only been having, you know, uh, excellent opinion and, and we're very happy that we have invited you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ramya. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So students can now post their questions in the chat box. Uh, in the meanwhile, I shall just post the questions we have received previously. So, sir, one of the questions we've received today uh, is what are the limitations so in this career of judiciary? What are the limitations that judges face? Okay. So, I think I had already answered this question, but since you have asked this question, you, uh, since you have asked me this question once again, so you don't have limitations per se. Limitations are basically judicial protocols and judicial conducts. Uh, limitations as in uh, that in comparison to a normal citizen, because you're not a normal citizen, you're holding an important post. And with that post comes responsibility. And this is something which you must have, uh, and, and you should also understand the reason because of which those limitations are imposed. The limitation is simple because when, uh, when you study in administrative law, the natural justice principle. So it's very important that, uh, that a judge should not be impacted by the environment which, in which he lives in. So that is why it is generally expected from a judge that his life needs to be confined, that the amount of social interactions would go very less. And the reason being is very, very simple, the same principle of natural justice. Apart from that, there are no, just like the other citizens of our country, just like the other professions. Here, the thing is that when you're leaving the district, you will have to take permission from your senior. All these things comes into the picture, right? Because you are holding an important post, post where you are basically going to decide upon the liberties of individuals. So that is why whenever you are uh, leaving the district or the permission and etc., all those things which are there in a governmental job comes into play. The only extra limitation, in my opinion, something which I feel personally is, is the limitation that the social interactions will go extremely less. Apart from that, there is nothing such exceptional which is there presently. Thank you, sir. So another question is, um, many of them, many other speakers have also recommended students to first take up practice or do litigation practice before joining and becoming a judge. However, now we have option to take up judiciary immediately after law school as a law student can enter subordinate judiciary. So could you tell us how different is it? So what is the difference between joining as a subordinate judiciary or taking up time to first practice and then joining the judiciary? Yes, it's a very relevant question because this question and this entire discussion and the fact that students need uh, students needs to have that two year or a three year experience in bar before becoming a judicial officer. See, let me tell you, everything depends upon the requirement of the examination. If in the uh, essentials, which is mentioned in the notification, if in that essential part it is mentioned that there is uh, no requirement. Uh, to have any experience, then in my opinion, absolutely you don't require to basically litigate. To tell you my story, I don't have, uh, I did not litigate even for a single day. Rather, I was preparing. I was in, in BHU, I was uh, I was pursuing my LLM. And at the same point of time, this, this, this course, uh, uh, this notification came in and appeared in the examination. 
uh so and and when you qualify the examination you have a very uh, you uh, you undergo a very exhaustive and a very proper training which goes for one year right which goes for one year and that training is more than sufficient to make you conversant about the practicalities and how one has to adjust as per the requirements and demands of a judicial life so in my opinion that absolutely not if you have this option if the state says that uh, that particular state in which you are appearing that uh, that you don't have to have that experience there's no requirement of having an experience no i don't think so that it is going to create any problems i personally did not litigate even for a single day and believe me i am doing very well at that i i hope that your question was answered yes sir thank you so uh, since as teachers we suggest students to also do all of their projects prepare well for the exam also take part in all of these competitions at times it gets too stressful for students on how to plan or chart their course of action as law students especially for a career such as the judiciary where the understanding is that okay you have to work really hard to get into this career there are a lot of eligibility criteria so would you suggest or recommend any path or any course of action for students on how should they plan their time as law students in law school yeah this is a very very good question and and to answer you uh, in all my interviews i appeared in mp judicial services interview i appeared in 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 up judicial services interview and of course finally the jharkhand judicial services interview my marks uh, in all these three examinations i had secured the second highest or the highest marks in the interview and let me tell you that i did not take any particular interview coaching per se for the preparation of the interviews rather i used to go and i used to just sit in the interview and and the and, and the reason and the reason was that i i i had basically explored different things in my college days so my request to all the students will be specifically in the first four years of your life see college is a platform it gives you a different opportunity for example now you are attending this course tomorrow you can you should write a paper so what happened is that while i was preparing for for this mooc court competitions while i was speaking at different podiums platforms i got the confidence interview is nothing but confidence if you are confident about speaking and if you trust your skills let me tell you you don't have to sit for mock interviews you sit for mock interviews to understand the demeanors and etc so every single thing which you do in your graduation years or in your college life all those things come into play all those things come into play all those things come into play so if you are participating in a moot court competition and you have spoken uh, uh you have spoken in the moot court competition as a speaker you have done research or etc yeah if you have presented papers if you are taking part if you are participating in a in a competition all these things are doing nothing but they are adding to the value of your personality and this is basically making your confidence so tomorrow when the interview happens let me tell you you will not have that any aspect of the fact that i am not confident a lot number of students say that they are not confident the reason being is that they have never spoken they are fearful of the fact of public speaking but once you have utilized the great avenues which a law school gives you all those things will come into the picture and you call and and you and you speak very confidently in the interview so in my opinion i will request all of you that specifically in the first 3 years of your college life or in the first four of your four years of your college life please enjoy please participate live your life in your fifth year when you are in fifth year, when you are in your fifth year at that point of time give yourself that time think about the judicial preparation and then begin your preparation i think more than this even to crack any state judicial examination in this country one year is more than sufficient so you don't have to start your planning right from the very day one of your law school it's very important to also enjoy the other possibilities which the law school gives so that was my answer thank you thank you sir so the next question that is mentioned in the chat box is whether the bar council exam is a prerequisite for entering judiciary no it is not again it depends upon the requirements of that particular state if the state says that you need to be an enrolled law advocate then for that particular thing you will have to appear in the examination or else it is not required it again depends upon the notification which is issued by the state that is why i am telling you the requirements and the criteria and the qualifications varies from state to state 
Thank you, sir. So another question is, what in your opinion are the essential skills that a law student should possess at least by the end of their fifth year so that they're ready to take up judiciary as a career option? See, again, there is one thing with, uh, which, which, which is important, whether you want to become an advocate or you want to become a professor or a judge, that is the correct understanding of law. And yes, added to it, you should have good writing skills. It's very important. You should have good writing and memory skills. Because to be very honest and let me be very blatant, judiciary is nothing but memorizing certain answers, memorizing the sections and just going and vomiting it out there. Of course, your analytical skills will come into picture when you become a judge, no doubt. But you don't tend to have that number of analytical questions in the mains examination. Right. So the basic thing is that you should be a very good writer. You should be able to write that many things in a period of three hours. If you are a good writer, you have an extra advantage over the other individuals who are going to sit in the examination. And then a good memory. Apart from that, let me tell you, it's a very normal question. What are the, there is no specific criteria, right? You want to become a good professor, you should have a good understanding of law. Similarly, uh, similarly uh, the same thing applies to DDC, but there is one thing. Because in the mains examination, you will have to write. And for that examiner, for that examiner or the question checker or the answer checker, you are no one. Your identity is your paper. So if you have a good, if you have good writing skills, automatically it will translate into billion marks. So in my opinion, a good memory plus good writing skills. That is it. Even if you don't have very great, if you even if you don't have great communication skills, believe me, all those things uh, uh, are not required much because a judge is not expected to be a great communicator. Yes. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, if a student has decided on judiciary as a career option in the future, then what are the internships that he or she should specifically pursue? Uh, this is a very good question. Now, if like, like I'll tell you about my internships. My, I was very clear right from the second year that I want to join judicial services or prepare for civil services. Uh, and I also wanted to join academic. So I had this clarity that I don't want to litigate and I don't want to join a firm or a company. So either I'll join the academics profession or I'll be, become a government servant. Now, so that is, and that is the precise reason because of which I never left my own state to pursue an internship in Delhi or etc. What I used to do is that in the summer vacations, I used to go to the local court scene. And believe you me, in the local courts, just by being there in the courtroom, interacting with the lawyers and seeing all those things, you will have a great understanding of CRPC, CPC and the law in action. Something which you are, the, uh, the things which takes place in the court in very simple manner I'm making you understand. Those things are not written in the books. So when your understanding of the, when your understanding of the law which you have read in your college gets supplemented and complemented by the experiences which you uh, which you live in the court, your entire understanding becomes very robust and strong in service. So I would request you to have internships in in your uh, in uh, yeah, in the local courts itself, not anywhere else. Thank you so much, sir. So if there is time, may may I pose one final question? Uh, yes. Yes, sure. so every career or every profession requires some constant motivation for the person to keep sustaining themselves in that career. We are not aware of much about the judiciary on how, what is it that constantly motivates the judge to continue being the judge. For example, as teachers, as we interact with students, we feel more and more motivated to continue doing it. So from a career perspective, we understand that judgeship is a very noble profession, a learned profession. But from a specifically career perspective, what is it that continues to motivate judges? See, and this is the, uh, the larger picture and the big question I was discussing about that after you become a judge, it's very important for you to have that sense of motivation, the fact that you are driven. And that particular thing can only be the thing that you are rendering through justice to a happiness or to the litigants which are coming to the court. If you have that feel that you are actually working for the masses, you are improving the lives of another. You just have to imagine like this, that imagine a situation that a person is suffering from a problem. He has a right and he's not able to enforce his right. And that is the reason because of which they are coming to the court. In India, people never come happily to the court. That is generally the last resort. So let us speak, let us uh, talk about a family dispute or a 498A case. 
so when there is a dispute of that level between the husband and wife between the family first of all they'll try to contact their relatives then they'll they talk to your uh, talk to their neighbors or the society people and they'll try to manage their dispute on their own right if they are not able to manage their dispute then they are coming to you and they are coming to you so that you basically solve their problem so that they are able to live their life properly so you need to understand this particular aspect when you understand this particular aspect only then will you be able if you are realizing this feeling if you are working for the fact that you will you will be promoted and you will get a salary hike all those things are not the consideration in your decision you have to actually have this feeling that you are working for the people who are actually in pain and it's your responsibility just like a doctor to help them only then can you can you uh, can you have a limitless motivation where you will be able to enjoy your your work okay so that was the answer amya thank you so much sir for patiently answering all your questions for all our all our questions from your answers itself it is very visible to us how passionate you are about the law the learning and the judiciary so thank you so much sir anaka you can take over i request all the participants to kindly switch on their cameras thank you i on behalf of cmr university school of legal studies extends a hearty word of thanks to sri mohit sir the workshop would have been incomplete without your presence this session gave us a lot of insights into the preparation for judiciary the question that why you want to become a judge made us all thinking and thought and though which through which we got to know the importance of the intrinsic motivation that should drive us we are very thankful for the preparation strategies that you provided through your session we understood the importance of interning in the lower courts through which procedural laws could be understood much better the way that you ended the session by talking about success and failure also gave us a wider purview thank you so much sir these are very helpful thank you ramya and everyone for having me here it was actually a great experience to interact with all of you and i i really hope that whatever i've spoken uh, must have benefited you in some sense or the other i wish all of you all the best prepare well and qualify the examination and become great great judicial officers thank you thank you so much thank you so much sir